Actuators 101. Let's talk about actuators and everything you can imagine when it comes to electric linear actuators like these. And look, we've got a whole range of them. Absolutely, pretty much, this covers every type of actuator you can imagine. We've got big industrial heavy duty 2,200 pound force actuators and little tiny five pound force actuators. These would be great for little robotic type ap applications or consumer electronics. And then this would be great for farming or something like that. And then there's everything in between. So we're going to take a few apart so you can see how they're built, what's inside them. And uh, we'll also run a couple so you can see how they work. So there are really a few different types of actuators. There's a, um, there's a regular rod style actuator where the rod simply slides in and out. So most of the actuators you see here, they, they cover that. So you give it a 12 volt pulse. This uh, shaft runs out and then retracts when you reverse polarity. Or there's this track actuator, which is like this one, which has this track that slides up and down the actuator so it doesn't have a shaft. So this has eight threaded screw holes here. You attach things to it and this slides up and down. Now there's also feedback actuators. Feedback actuators, it's the same as a regular actuator, but it has positional control, which is pretty important for some applications if you need to know exactly what you're moving, where it is, where it starts, where it stops, where you want it to start, etc. And you can do that through a controller, an Arduino, and we have one, we're gonna show you how to do that. And there are three different types of feedback actuators. There's potentiometer built um, feedback, horse sensors, and optical sensors. And we have three of those. We're gonna take them all apart so you can actually see what's inside it and how they work. And there's also different types of speed and force as well. So typically, force and speed trade off against each other. So you want high force, you're gonna get low speed. If you want high speed, you're gonna get low force. They always trade off against each other. There's nothing you can do about that. That's just part of the gearing system that works inside them. So let's start by running a couple so you can see how they work and we'll show you the difference, um, what's inside these things. Okay, so an actuator really is nothing more than a motor, which is a rotary, so it goes round with some gears that turn a lead screw like this. The lead screw turns like that and it has this nuts that slides up and down. And then the shaft, which moves in and out, is connected and that's what makes the actuator go in and out. But what stops it is limit switches. A limit switch is really nothing more than it's a micro switch, just a little micro switch, which cuts the power to the motor, but they have diodes on the back. So the back has diodes. You can see a diode here. And what that does, even though it cuts power going to the motor in one direction, so it would get to the end, and what would happen here, you can see this, this tab. So as the motor turns, this slides down, and then when it gets to the end, it trips the switch like that. So it cuts power to the motor, but because it has a diode on the back, it allows you to reverse polarity and keeps the motor running. So these sit down on the inside of pretty much all actuators have them built into them. And so the distance between here and here is essentially what the stroke is. Uh, the further apart they are, the longer the stroke, the closer together they are, the smaller the stroke. And that is basically essentially how an actuator works. It just slides up and down and cuts the power off and goes back and forth. Now, let's take an actuator apart so you can see exactly what's inside one. Now, there is one actuator you can buy that has adjustable limit switches because, as you can see, this is inside inside the actuator you can't adjust the limit switches but this model allows you to adjust the end position so the um, one of the limit switches at the end so if this is a 10 inch stroke you can adjust the last inch of the stroke so you could get anywhere between 9 and 10 inches of stroke out of it what you do is you just un undo those with your hand and you can just slide this and there's a gauge on here so you can see 
So you just uh, adjust this to wherever you want, tighten them up, and then run the actuator and it'll stop um, whatever distance you've set here. Now let's take an actuator apart so you can see what's inside one. So uh, you can see all the components inside the actuator. So here we've got a classic actuator. This doesn't have feedback. We'll take one apart with feedback and you can see exactly what's inside it. So it's basically made up of a motor, the lead screw inside here with the um, limit switches, and then in here we'll have the gears. So we'll take, I've pre-taken this apart here. I've left one screw in, but let's take the base off so you can see what's inside. There you go, there's a gasket that sits between them and you can see all the gears. So there's the, the pinion from the motor. So as this turns, the gear ratio here is what dictates the force. So this style actuator comes anywhere from 35 pounds to 200 pound force model. And all that changes is the gear, gear, gearing inside here. So it's these gear ratios. So you can see when I'm turning the motor here, this turns quite slowly. This is directly connected to, and you can, we'll take that off. There we go. And you can see here, there's a lead screw we showed you here, and that is the main shaft. And you'll notice on this model, this one is a little bit wider than this one, this nut. And that's because this is a high-speed unit. And the thing is, if you go, when the shaft is moving fast, this goes so quick, even when you cut the power, that it can overrun the limit switches. So you have to make this twice as wide so that it has the sort of a parachute landing and slows down and doesn't overrun and cause binding. And these are metal gears, by the way, but you can see there's, there's no feedback whatsoever inside this actuator. So let's show you one that does have feedback built into it. Okay, now we're gonna show you an actuator that has built-in feedback. Now you can, this has a built-in potentiometer feedback. The potentiometer is, looks like this. And as you turn this and put a voltage across here, it gives you a voltage output. So let's say you put five volts in, as this turns from one end to the other, you get a reading of between zero and five volts, where zero would be an actuator all the way extended and five volts would be all the way retracted and everywhere in between would be the position of the shaft and uh, this actuator as you can see is slightly longer body than the regular style classic actuator these are essentially the same actuator but the body is longer because it has to hold somewhere inside this thing so let me take it apart, and I've pre-done this already, so to speed this up. Here we go, take the gasket off. And now you can see there's two wire harnesses now, one for the power and one for the potentiometer. And what happens is there's extra gearing in here, so as the gears inside turn, that turns this uh, potentiometer and it takes 10 turns for this to go all the way from one end, five volts, to the other end, which would be zero volts outputs. So you can see how that worked. So the downside is, is these feedback actuators take up a bit of space because you need to house this with some gears. That's basically how that works. Now let's show you a different type of feedback actuator. Now let me show you an optical feedback actuator. So this is uh, the Fugeli OS series and it looks like a regular actuator. The housing is a little bit smaller because optical sensors don't require quite as much space as a um, potentiometer feedback actuator. I've already kind of pre-taken this apart so you can see. And now I'll show you inside. It has this little circuit board and this plastic disc with holes in it spins around. It's connected directly to the lead screw. So as this turns around, 
this optical sensor right here sends light through the holes and every time it passes through the holes it counts now the downside of using an optical sensor or a hole sensor which works in the same way is that it doesn't give you absolute position like this does what this does it just counts pulses so you have to whatever control system you have has to have a homing type of sequence built into it so that it goes all the way to the one end sets the count at zero and then as it goes to the other end of the stroke it would count all the different pulses and then divide it up over the entire stroke to give you a very precision or control of the distance and actuated moves so as you can imagine this was to turn just one i can't really move it here but if it was to turn just one small amount the the stroke movement here for move, going from one hole to the other would be absolutely minute so one pulse here is around one micron of movement in the sh in the uh, rod so that's quite um, very very good positional control well, let's see if we can take this out so you can see exactly how this works too you can see that the little sensor here and the disc just slides straight through there and that is the disc and that's how that one works and now let me show you how a hole sensor works okay so we've already showed you two feedback actuators the potentiometer style and the optical uh, sensor style these units these super duty actuators they have hole sensors built into them and hole sensors work on a magnetic type of um, system and the way that works is on the motor here you can see and we'll unscrew this as well so you can see exactly where the hole sensor sits and that is the hole sensor PCB and you can see this magnetic sensor so what happens is the motor has a we'll pull the armature out and this is what it looks like inside a, the motor two magnets either side and then the coil big bearing on the back the commutator here and then this is a magnet what happens when that sits inside here and, sp and spins around these two sensors here they're called hole sensors there's two of them so you can sense direction take a closer look at that and what that does is that counts the revolutions so every revolution of the armature which is this this is the armature every time that rotates one this uh, counts one pulse and sends a pulse feedback into the controller so you can see there's four wires here so you have four wires because you've got two hole sensors to measure um, direction so it can tell which direction it's going in and that sits right behind the motor and for the motor you can see the two brushes see these brushes they're on springs and they make contact with the armature here and that puts power into these windings which creates a magnetic source here and that's what makes it rotate basically so there we have three types of feedback we have hole sensors potentiometers with a built-in potentiometer built -in potentiometer like that and then the optical and the optical ones work just like the whole sensor you put in five volts and it counts pulses so the whole sensor and the potentiometer uh, whole sensor and the optical are actually very very similar very similar style okay so how do you wire up an actuator and how do you power an actuator well very simply you need a 12 volt power supply like this one and if i'll just show you very quickly 
how an actuator runs, you just add the two wires to a power supply like that. You reverse the wires and the actuator changes direction. But you don't want to do it like that. You need a switch. So here are typical rocker switches that you would use to actually control an actuator manually. And there's two different types. So there's ones like this. So see how it stays in position up, stays there, down, stays there, and you have to switch it back. Or ones like this. These are called a momentary switch because they flick back into position. They flick back to the center when you let go. Whereas these, they stay there. So this is a sustaining type, this momentary because it just stays there momentary. Now let me show you how you wire these up. You notice on the back, they all have six connectors. And that's because these switches, they have two poles. You need two poles to be able to reverse the polarity. That's how these switches work. So let's quickly hook one up so you can see. And very simple, we'll use this type. You add, we're gonna, this can be to the actuator. They have a jumper wire because you add one to each corner, one to that corner, one to the other corner, like that. And we have another one here, exactly the same. It's just, it's just got a pigtail. So we just splice them. So we add that one there. This one goes across to the other corner. So these two will go to the actuator. And I've just put alligator clips on so you can, we can uh, easily show you. And then the two center ones will go to the power source. So we'll just do that one there. I have another one here. We'll do that. So we'll just connect these to the power source and it doesn't matter which way around. It could be either way around. It doesn't really matter. And then we connect this to, let's use this actuator here. Now when we run the switch, you'll see Make sure they're not touching. And this is a momentary, so we'll just do. So there you go. So this is a momentary. So look, I have to hold the switch for it to, to move. And if I switch this now, let's switch it to a sustaining switch so you can see exactly how a sustaining switch works. Oops, and this one even lights up. So now look, it just will go all the way. Now it's stopping, but it's not burning out the motor because actuators have built-in limit switches that cuts the power off to the actuator inside. Now you've seen what an actuator looks like inside with an optical sensor and a, and a potentiometer sensor. What does that mean? What does that mean your actuator can do? So let me show you in very simple terms. Here is a super duty actuator. This has built-in feedback and we're gonna use this controller to demonstrate what an actuator can do that has built-in feedback. So I've already pre-wired it into these, these connectors that come with this controller. So it's simply two wires for um, power and then the other four wires are for feedback. So we'll just plug that in. Now these units have uh, hall sensors built in, which if you remember, hall sensors still require the program to have a calibration, a sort of a homing sequence. So that's the first thing you do. So we'll, we'll first we'll go actuator set and do calibrate. So what it does is it runs all the way to the end of the stroke and then back again. So these units are slow, slower because they're a high force. So these are 400 pounds. So remember I talked about the gear ratio that changes inside. It's a trade-off, you want high force, you get low speed. So these are a little bit slower because they are 400 pound force. So it's done a full calibration. So what the computer's done is it's 
run a full cycle in and out. It's counted the pulses that are in the, um, the hall center. And now you have full positional control. It's home button, manual operation. So extend. So now it'll extend to the position I already told it to and stop. You cannot do that with a regular two wire actuator. You have to have an actuator that has built in feedback, such as hall sensor or optical sensor or potentiometer like this one. So retract, it'll go back to the exact same position. Go back to the home position. Now there is a, another benefit of having feedback in actuators in that you can run multiple actuators at the same time and they will be synced. So here I've got two, I've plugged them in and if we extend it, well now what it does, it runs them at exactly the same speed. Retract. It runs them at the same speed. Again, what it's doing is it's counting the pulses in each actuator and it's making sure that they're counting at exactly the same time. Um, if I change this now to the stroke length, I oh know I've done that one. Uh, limits, let's put that back to there, save, and then manual extend. If I apply pressure on, if I apply pressure on one of these actuators, what it's doing is it's sensing that one is going slower than the other. And so what it does is it slows down the other actuator to compensate for the speed difference. And you'll see they will stop at exactly the same time see and that's because it has the built-in feedback now let's plug in a, a different actuator that also has feedback so you can see the difference so here I've just plugged in a, um, a micro actuator this is a Fageli 20 millimeter stroke and uh, it's pretty small for a small stroke it's quite long though and that's because the motor has to sit inside the body behind the gearbox and then behind the shaft plus and this has feedback built into it which is quite amazing that such a small actuator that has uh, built-in feedback but uh, I can just show you this running so it's quite a small unit but can still push five pounds of force and um, yeah that just shows how you can have feedback still in a small actuator. Let's talk about noise because it's actually quite an important thing. Um, why is one actuator noisier than another? For example, this one, we'll just, I just connected it to the controller. This is the Super Duty one. It can push 400 pounds of force, but that is quiet. Listen to that. That's a very quiet actuator. But if I run, say this, um, classic style actuator it's quite noisy so why what is the difference well let's show you let's take them apart let's take them apart so you can see what's inside one actuator that make and what makes it more um, noisier than the other so this one we showed you earlier this has the spur gears inside they're metal gears and it's the same actuator and what happens is this type of gear, when these gears are engaging with each other, they're basically smacking each, other, each other's gear, and that's the noise that you hear. Whereas the Super Duty actuator is super quiet because it has built inside to it this helical gear system. This is a worm gear, it's a worm gear drive system. And even though it's they're made of nylon, which is very good for um, uh, efficiency uh, it's also very quiet so that's why and we'll just show you again we'll retract this one 
because there's not spur gears that are not hitting each other the way they do with this. So this, the motor turns, it's a worm, it turns this gear, which then turns this, and then it has this helical drive system, which turns this, and that turns the lead screw. So it's a very different setup inside. And that is what makes the noise what it is. Now these units are a little bit more expensive um, because of that. But if you don't care about noise, then these units are just fine. If you do care about noise, and let's do a noise test again. We'll run this and run this at the same time. See, there is a huge, huge noise difference. These actuators also, these are the utility actuators. They have a very similar drive mechanism inside these two. Let me hook this up and show you how quiet this unit is. Okay, so I've just plugged in this utility for getting actuated into the controller so you can hear how quiet this unit is. See, that's very quiet. And again, that's because it uses this helical style drive mechanism. These units come in different forces. This one can push up to uh, 220 pounds, which is still quite a lot for a, such a small compact unit. And, and you can see this very similar form factor. The motor is all built in here. Inside this case, it's a similar kind of setup. This is a one inch stroke and this is a, I think a eight inch stroke. And again, let's listen to the sound. Big difference. So that explains why some actuators are noisier than other actuators. Now here's an actuator that has a, a, another drive mechanism inside. It, this is a planetary style gear mechanism. And you see these in typically um, actuators where the motor is in line with the rest of the shaft like this one too. This also has a planetary style and you can see, listen how quiet this unit is. Okay, so we have to talk about running an actuator in terms of voltage and current or amps, because it's very important. And you need to understand the difference. What does voltage do to an actuator when you run it at different voltages? Let's, so let's start with the voltages. So here we've got it hooked up and I've got this set to 12 volts. This is a these types of power supplies are extremely useful. They're very handy um, because you can change everything. So what happens is this is set at 12 volts, as you can see, but let's show, let's show what happens when you lower it down. So now let's run it at five volts. See, it goes down. So speed is directly proportional to voltage. Higher voltage, 20 volts, that will run fast. So it's also very noisy. So now let me show you, I'll put it at 10 volts and let's show you what happens to the current draw. So we've got high and low here. So we'll put it on low so you can see um, what uh, the amperage does. So you can see when it's running, it's pushing about point, point 0.2 of an amp. If we put force on it, that will go up. See? So the more pressure you put, the more resistance you put on the motor, the more power is required to make it run. And if you want to stall it, it would eventually burn out the motor, which is not good. So if I put it on high, you can see the maximum current draw when it's at stall. So this goes up to three amps maximum. So now see it's pulls almost one because I've put it on high, so it's almost one amp. So that's the maximum power. If we use a larger actuator with more, more force, so we'll go up one step, we'll use this model of actuator, which as you can see, it's slightly bigger. It'll require more current draw to make it run. But, 
And you notice it barely moves. Because there's so much more power in this. I need to put it onto low mode to be able to see. So you can put it in low mode for you to see the difference it makes. So now I've hooked up a larger actuator. This is the track actuator. It's got a bigger motor. Um, I've set it to 12 volts and you'll see the current draw. So even if you, if you put pressure on it, you can see the current draw go up. And that's just because the motor needs more power to overcome the external force that we're applying to it. So that's why you see the current draw go up. So it's important, therefore, when you're installing actuators to make sure you use the right size wire gauge, the right thickness of wire for the size of, size of motor. So if you look at this, this big power max actuator, Look how thick these wires are, because this one takes around 10 amps at full load, and so it requires these much thicker wires, whereas a smaller actuator like this one, this takes about three amps at full load, and so you don't need as thick a wire. But it's important to know the difference between the two. So that is Actuators 101. That is the basics of actuators. That shows you how an actuator works, what's inside an actuator, how they run, what is feedback control on an actuator, what does that mean, and what can that do for you. And I think that covers pretty much everything we can.